Thank you all for coming. Um, so my name is Ryan Holmes. I work for KaiPod Learning, and uh, my one of my primary responsibilities right now is to work with these wonderful people who are all planning to launch a micro school uh, in August or September of this upcoming year. They're all in different stages of do, of planning that, and so wanted to talk about that and and get their insights. Um, and uh, they're all part of the KaiPod Catalyst Fellowship, which is our program that supports micro school founders and launching. Um, and so it's been a delight to work with them all and they are incredibly smart, talented, wonderful educators. And I'm gonna let them introduce themselves. So if you guys could just sort of share your background leading into your decision to apply for Catalyst and then sort of what made you want to apply. Um, go ahead, who wants to start? Uh, I'll start, we'll just go down. <laughs> yeah. uh, my name is Benita Gordon. I currently live in Miami, Florida. Um, and I think it was just a series of occurrences throughout my 25 years of teaching that I finally was like, you know what, let me retire from a traditional classroom and do something else. Let me start a micro school, wasn't sure how I looked, um, started following people, actually started following people who won the Vela and the Yaz Prize on Instagram. Mm -hmm. And that's how I just started understanding where everybody was and what I needed to do. Um, and then saw the Catalyst program jump up on LinkedIn, I think. Um, Instagram and was like, let me just apply. I'm not really sure which direction I'm going. And it's been one of the best decisions for me being an educational entrepreneur that I've made um, since leaving a traditional classroom. So I'm Amanda Lucas. Um, I originally was a writer editor. So my undergrad is in English. And um, after college, I went into the magazine industry. So I worked for Parenting Magazine, Parents Magazine, American Baby. And then I freelanced for a bunch of magazines. Um, and then I made a, a career change in 2015, and I became a teacher. I taught everything from pre-K to eighth grade. Middle school is my sweet spot. So, um, But I found that like the kids would say, they would come to me and be like, what do I need to do to pass, right? Like, what do you want from me in order to, like, like I was Oz, and I had the ticket. Mm. Like, I had the the certificate saying that they had a brain, you know? And I was like, yeah, no, this doesn't work. So um, when the pandemic happened, I started a pod in my home and it, it just lit me up. I, I was able to curate, create curriculum, follow the students' interests. Um, and then I moved to New Jersey and I felt entirely alone. I felt like I was crazy. I wanted to start a micro school. Um, I didn't know it was called a micro school. Um, but I wanted to start exactly what I'm starting now. And I didn't know that this existed, that it was in motion for a lot of people already, um, until I found a micro school that was already working with KaiPod. And they introduced us, and I found the Catalyst program, and then just the, my whole world opened up. And here we are, launching in September. I have families enrolled already, which is really hard. And, uh, but yeah, here we go. <laughs> So I'm Tom Dahl. Um, I'm from California originally, Northern California. Moved to Arizona uh, New Year's Eve 2011. So I moved from uh, California with my girlfriend, uh, became my fiance, my wife, and now we have three kids together. Uh, when we moved, she was traveling for work. So I left my career behind and supported the family while she was traveling every week. Um, that lasted for about eight years when I finally realized I needed to take care of somebody else's kids once in a while, you know, get out, maybe earn a little bit of golf money, and that's really all I was interested in, was to, was to leave the house, and, you know, and I had a friend that said, you know, give substitute teaching a try. Mm -hmm. Day one of substitute teaching, it, it, it changed everything. Um, I had a, a vice principal come in, because I had a particularly challenging class, and he walked in, looked me up and down, and he said, you'll be fine. I was like, you haven't even heard a word I've said. Um, but within you know, two or three weeks, that same teacher had asked me to be his permanent sub when he would go on uh, vacation or um, unplanned medical leave. Um, and uh, I was writing his curriculum for him. I was doing lesson plans. They were taken from other, for other teachers. And pretty soon I you know, said, OK, this is a career now. This isn't just subbing. I'm not going to do this just for golf money. Um, Probably should have stayed subbing if it was about the money. <laughs> but I went in, took out student loans, went back, got my master's in secondary education, um, and got my own classroom at the same time. Um, Arizona's pretty, pretty free about uh, allowing students or teachers who are becoming teachers to teach in their own classroom of record. It's a very proactive uh, state when it comes to education. Um, but it didn't take long in the classroom for me to realize that these, this system's broken. Mm -hmm. I mean, 
it, it was uh, every kid was a can that was being kicked down the down the road. Um, we had students coming out of the pandemic who were way behind grade level, um, didn't know my name as the teacher in May, and became a freshman in high school the next year. Um, and there were kids that requested to be retained, parents that requested to retain the kids, and the school said, nope, you're going to high school. Um, I think one of the issues with my particular district is we were a, an elementary school district, and we fed to a completely different district for high school. So it was really out of sight, out of mind. Once we're done with eighth grade, we don't worry about graduation rates, we just want to promote. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what happened. And straight from, from admin, they said, well, we don't get paid for them twice, so we're not keeping them an extra year. And I'm like, this is a broken system. There's no way I'm going to spend the next 10, 15, 20 years here, you know, just being, a, I like to say, a cog in a broken machine. Um, when ESA went uh, universal in Arizona, I started reading up on different education opportunities, you know, whether I could go teach at a, at a private school or a charter, um, and learn more about homeschooling and micro-schooling and co-ops. And under whatever definition, really, Arizona says, you teach the way that's effective and we'll support it. And so I started dabbling um, in a, a group tutoring, one-on-one um, -on -one tutoring, and then got connected with a KaiPod Catalyst cohort number one member who said, you know, check out KaiPod Catalyst. They'll, they'll walk you through exactly what you need to, do, need to do. They'll tell you the questions you don't know to ask. Um, they'll connect you with resources, with curriculum, with lawyers, with, you know, compliance officers, just everything that you need this program's got it. So I applied and uh, got an interview and was accepted into the program pretty quick and that, that completely changed everything again. Mm -hmm. So not my first career, not my second career, um, but I, I know how organizations are supposed to be run uh, and what doesn't work. And so I get to do that from the ground up with you know, all these colleagues here. I think I went over my time, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, my name is Gina Wilson. I am not an educator at all. I've never taught. I don't have a background in that. I'm actually a recovering gamer. Um, and <laughs> there's, there's recovery? Yeah. There's, there's recovery. Just recovery. Um, and my background is actually in IT. So I have a uh, bachelor's in computer science and master's in cybersecurity. Um, but the reason why I even got into this at all and wanting to at least make a change in education um, my daughter was born eight years ago, and she was born with hydrocephalus, and uh, she is nonverbal autistic. Mm -hmm. And so um, initially I put her in a pre-K program. Um, that didn't fare so well. They didn't have all the resources for her. Uh, once she completed pre-K, I was hoping to put her in some type of summer program that would supplement what she learned, and then COVID hit. Um, and then all the kids that were in her classroom and a lot of folks in the community all had issues. There were no summer programs that could accommodate them. Um, with nonverbal autistic children, um, again, masking, it was very difficult because they need to see, you know, the motions of the mouth and all of that to comprehend and try to understand. So what happened, uh, a group of us moms got together and we said, let's do this ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, no one else is doing it, we can do it. And so we got a grant from Vela, and I think that was the first year Vela started offering grants. And so we were accepted into Vela's program, and it gave us enough to catapult that first summer. Um, the second year, we said we need to do this again, but keep it going um, year round if we can. And so uh, that second year, I was operating out of the third floor of my house. Um, and then I found out all these rules and regulations of how you can't run a school out of your house. Um, so that was trial and error too. And so I reached out to Vela again and they said, we'll help. Uh, and so now I'm in a commercial space. And uh, again, this is all trial and error. I run businesses. I don't run schools. So I'm learning a lot. So I own an IT staffing and consulting firm. And I thought it'd be easy because I know how to run a business. No, schools and businesses don't really go in and in. So I got shut down a few times. Um, fire codes, uh, so many ordinances, so many rules, laws, regulations. And I was here last year at the Hybrid Schools Conference, and someone from Cohort 1 said, why don't you look into chi -Fi? Um they will literally hold your hand and get you off the ground mm -hmm. and you won't be shutting down anymore. You'll be aware <laughs> of what's going on. And 
And so that's how I found out about it. That's why I joined, and I'm so glad to be here. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Um, if you guys could just give a sense of your a high-level vision, a brief sort of overview of the, the type of students that you're hoping to come to your school, um, the, what you're just trying to build for the community you're in. Do you want to go down this way again? Oh, yeah. We can. Yeah, yeah. So, you, you start. Um, what was the question? No. Uh, <laughs> so, um, Miami Micro Learn Hub, we focus on tweens and teens. Um, I'm a, also a middle school teacher for about 18 years, and um, people don't like, like them. Like, let's be real. Um, <laughs> but I love them. And a lot of times they're at that age where they hate school, but they still love to learn. And so that's what, our, that's what our philosophy is. We want to catch them so they still love to learn and then help them and guide them and to be active in whatever they love. If they STEM, that's fine. If you're um, humanities, that's great. Project-based learning, we have you. And so that's what we want to look. And we want to look at, um, it's not a lot of models right now. Um, we're coming. <laughs> but it's a, it was never a lot. So everything was always more K through eight or K through three. And so that's what we're looking at now. So that's what we want to focus on. Like, how can we still catch our students, um, give them individualized learning for tweens and teens? Yeah, so I also, can you guys hear me fine? Um, I also um, am focused on middle school, so 10 to 13 year olds. Um, my school is called Lucas Literacy Lab for obvious reasons. Um, um, so. Literacy is, as you guys know, it's reading, writing, speaking, and listening. So it's essentially communications. Mm -hmm. um, so I, the way that people get excited about STEM and they're like, oh, it's so hands-on and the kids are going to be doing things, people are not that excited about literacy, and they should be, because mm -hmm. we're in a communication era right mm -hmm. now, right? So um, communication is influence, and it's power, right? So in my school, my students are going to be learning to, um, to present consistently. They're going to have um, mastery of what they're learning. But then instead of standardized testing, they're going to be the, the expert, and they're going to be teaching their community uh, through podcasting, through creating videos, um, through editing, through um, creating magazines and newsletters and books, and in a very hands-on way, um, very similar to the STEM model, but just literacy-based. Um, but I also really care about my kids being in nature. Um, so I partnered with a local farm. So every Thursday, my kids are going to be at the farm. Um, fishing, gardening, uh, canning, preserving, taking care of the animals. Uh, of course, we have like an hour a day outside. They have two hours in the afternoon to, to focus on their interests and to, to um, be innovative and creative and have space. Um, because the goal is for them to take ownership of their learning. Um, so yeah, so that's the, the, the whole model of, of my school. Does that make sense? Yes. yes. Okay. Y'all yes. <laughs> yes. doing great. <laughs> Um, my program is called Moriana Boys Academy. Um, Moriana is a kind of a made up word, but it's uh, meant to invoke the idea of uh, St. Thomas More. If anybody's familiar with the man of all seasons, man for all seasons, um, it's uh, his character that I'm trying to instill in my students. Um, we're kind of walking a fine line between learning center and micro school. Uh, we start off in the morning where every, every student is on a personal academic plan. Mm -hmm. They bring their own curriculum that's been selected by their parents with my help. Um, and I kind of hover as a coach. And everybody's working if, if today is a live class for one student or book work for another student or a free day for another student, whatever kind of assistance they need, uh, I'm there to, to kind of guide through as a parent would if it was a homeschool uh, child. Um, let me rewind a little bit. My school is for boys only. Um, mm -hmm. I have six to eight at any given time. Um, we do the academics in the morning, uh, enrichment in the afternoon, so that's coding or STEM or art or music, uh, workshops with professionals, um, getting out into the community. Uh, and then Fridays are the, the great days. This is my selling point day. Uh, Fridays are excursion days where, uh, you know, a typical class may go to the zoo every year and just look at the animals. Well, if we're going to go to the zoo, we're going to go to the conservatory and we're going to talk with the experts and we're going to get behind the scenes because I have six mm -hmm. kids. I don't have 250 kids. Exactly. Um, I have uh, connections with a, a farrier in the Midwest. So a farrier makes horseshoes, um, mm -hmm. but he does the horseshoes for lame horses. 
so all of them are custom made and custom fitted. He's going to bring his foundry, his forge, his forge, and actually do a workshop making these horseshoes, showing what he can actually get done. Um, uh, we're going to go mountaineering with a bushcraft uh, professional, go into the Superstition Mountains and actually spend a night. You know, so we're going to actually get out into the world and experience mm -hmm. the world. You know, if you're behind four, four walls in a classroom, um, you're probably not going to get these experiences. Mm -hmm. uh, and so this is the idea that not everybody is geared towards college. There's tons of trades that yes. are making mm -hmm. six figures, and yes. a lot of kids are either tracked to be, you know, labor or a leader in public school system. And here it's the kids going to figure out exactly what they are themselves. Mm -hmm. And for me, um, I've had to narrow my focus thanks to um, Umar and Ryan. Um, <laughs> it was a bit too broad. <clears throat> Initially, I was thinking K through eight because I wanted to help as many kids as I could. Um, that didn't work. Um, so now I'm doing K through two, um, and, and I'm working on a model that's blending both neurodiverse and neurotypical kids. Um, our nonverbals really learn well from children who are speaking, who yes. love language, and we all know kids like to talk <laughs> <laughs> a lot. <clears throat> and so <clears throat> it helps them quite a bit <clears throat> being, <clears throat> excuse me, being immersed with, you know, other children who who are communicating. Um, the other thing we're doing is we're bringing in therapists. So um, we've already incorporated speech therapy. We also want to incorporate play therapy. And there are a few different models for um, helping nonverbal children learn to talk. So there's RDI. And mm -hmm. there are two or three others that I just learned about, too, from a parent that I spoke with um, last week, actually trying to recruit and get new numbers, or more numbers, um, to my school. And another thing that we do too, which I haven't seen very many models like this, is we have a co-working space at the front of our school for parents. Mm -hmm. And so it, it's nice because we are in a low-income area in Lilburn, Georgia, and a lot of those parents need either some place to be. Um, some of them do work from home. Some of them are working to find jobs. Now, here's the nice thing about my background and what I do in IT recruiting and consulting and then also other types of um, recruiting and placement too is I can help those parents find jobs. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's, it's a really interesting two-gen approach mm -hmm. um, that I'm taking with my model and, and it's, it's been fascinating so far. That's great. So next question is, <clears throat> what has been a surprising aspect about opening a school or something that's been challenging for you? This could be a challenge that you've overcome or something that you're currently grappling with. <laughs> 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 or many things. So, let, me, let me jump in real quick. Yeah. Um, in Arizona, we have ESAs. We're one of the first states that has universal ESAs. Um, the biggest challenge is trying to put yourself out there and then all of these anti-school choice programs and people attacking every little thing. They don't ask questions, they just declare what they know about you, they declare what they know about your program, and they declare why they know it's gonna fail and why everybody <laughs> that's reading this should stop reading and look away. And then you call Umar and, and then I call Umar and, and tell him, don't engage, don't engage. <laughs> <laughs> right? So I have to call up my surrogate, I call that's my dad, that's I call my sister, true. hey, Ellie, you got a different last name, can you comment on this? <laughs> And so that's a big challenge, really having this confidence. I mean, you can probably hear my voice shakes because it's difficult to engage in some of these conversations. Um, but even, even behind the protection of a computer monitor and a keyboard, people come at you. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's mm -hmm. uh, something I wasn't expecting. Um, I think for me it was location. Um, I think I came, I, I came in like... So I'm saying, I came here like, everyone's going to love this. Like, yep. like what are you talking about? I, I, I was in the system, and we know the system doesn't work for all children. Mm -hmm. um, I taught during COVID in Florida, which we never closed. Mm -hmm. um, and I saw my students thrive. Um, I had to adjust how I was teaching. So even though you wanted me to do a 90-minute class on the Zoom with eighth graders, what are you talking about? And so then I was like, okay, let's, let's change the model. Let's get myself situated. And so for me, I was like, you know, I'm going to go find a location. I'm, I'm, I'm opening a school, yes. And they were like, well, what's wrong with, is the school around the corner? Yes. <laughs> and so for me, it was location, and then it was funding. So in order to purchase something in Miami, you have to have money. Yeah. 
And so those are the two things that threw me off. So I knew I know what I'm doing. I have support. I have a whole team. I'm in a fellowship. But coming across finding a location, um, and not just any location, it needs to be safe. I need to have some green space. Right. Um, eighth graders have to be outside just as much, just as, much as an eight-year-old. Yes, mm -hmm. um, and so the, all of that was important. And it was difficult looking. Um, and like you say, I get on Slack, and I'm like, rrr, 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 just going off. <laughs> but that's why you have to have a tribe. I call them a tribe. You have to have a tribe, and you have to say, okay, wait, did you look here? Or here's a suggestion, or go look here, or go back and ask the realtor this. And so I think for me it was location and then funding. Um, and both worked out, but it is a process. And I think I came in thinking, oh, we'll be open this school year, and then I joined Catalyst, and they were like, okay, no. <laughs> um, we need to work through some more things because it did make you it does make you process some more things because I came in and was like here's a location we're going to go but you need to inspect it and you need to look at zoning and you need to look at code and so it was important to have a tribe to say um, I thought I was just going to find this building or I thought a church was going to open <laughs> and they were like no and so those are the things that that was my biggest hurdle um, for me I think there's two things one is that I'm a fake extrovert so like I will get up and talk to people and engage but inside I'm screaming um, so you really have to put yourself out there like a lot um, and I just moved to my state a year ago and a month in I was like I'm gonna start this and I didn't know anybody I was away from my family I was in a new place and I get nervous and um, so I was I had to go learn the community, talk to these people and say, hey, this is what I want to do. And they were like, who are you? No. <laughs> um, and it hurt a lot. But um, I mean, and I, and I cried a lot. <laughs> but I had to, I had my team and, I, and everybody would just be like, just, just take the next step. Just do the next thing. Just as long as you don't give up, it's going to be okay. Um, so that was one thing. And the other thing was being like wearing every hat, being every person, being the whole company. You know what I mean? Like I had to learn how to do everything, bookkeeping, marketing, the works. And I'm a teacher. Okay. I'm a teacher and a writer. And um, I just want to teach kids. Um, so the, the startup process has been a lot of not teaching. Um, I mean, I still teach, but like, you know, the, the process of doing this is, is every other aspect of the business um, and failing a lot and having to hit the drawing board again and figure it out like a puzzle. I mean, it's fun. It's very fun, but it's also like you have to have some grit because, mm -hmm. yeah, it'll knock you down. Yeah. So. And for me, it's, it's two things. Obviously, regulation. I talk about that all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I get tired of talking about it. Um, that was huge. I mean, there were so many times we were at the school like, yes, it's open, and then code enforcement flight. And we were like, oh, my gosh, here we go again. <laughs> okay, we're getting shut down. What do we do next? Um, and so that was huge. And then creating a successful financial model, which Amr has been on me about that. <laughs> like, I know you want to help people, but it's also got to be profitable so you don't yeah. get shut down. Yeah. So, you know, we all have big hearts. Yes. Um, that's yeah. the reason why we're here yeah. because, you know, education just isn't very profitable, period. Right. And so, but just at least ensuring that my model works yes. and that um, I can still have students and help the lower income families, but yet keep my business going and be able to keep people on payroll. Um, again, I thought I was going to be fantastic at that because, oh, I, I've had my um, consulting firm for 10 years, but no, <laughs> absolutely not. So there were so many things that I didn't even think of. Um, just filling out that template, it made a huge difference. Oh, that template. Yeah, yeah the template is it's everything. True. <laughs> yes. We go back to it over and over yes. again. <laughs> Especially yeah. when you're an English teacher, not a math person. Yeah. <laughs> that's, one the, that's one of the things that the Kai Paul Catalyst program is all of us have felt alone and lost at given times, but Slack's right there with yeah. like 75 people in our Slack right. channel. 110 people yeah. in our Slack oh, channel. Yeah. Yeah. So we have three cohorts, all the executives, and, and then some other consultants, I think, that are in there that, you know, if you have a, a compliance issue or a zoning issue or a curriculum issue, I mean, it's only a couple minutes away yeah. from an answer. You know, yes. Any time of day, because we're all across the time zones. Yeah. But, yeah. So it is it is a lonely feeling at times, but mm -hmm. it's it doesn't last long because you mm -hmm. definitely can reach out and find somebody that's that's yeah. been there, has already, you know, walked that path or can give you an idea of a of a workaround. Yeah. So true. That's that's been probably the most important part of Catalyst. Yeah. You know what, just to quickly piggyback off of that, I'm glad you mentioned that, um, Tom, because even in 
our group, we have now uh, groups for different states, yes. which is super helpful. And Christina and I actually have piggybacked quite a bit off of each other, trying to navigate through regulation in Georgia. So yeah. she's in Columbus. She's only an hour away. And so I, I was like fretting the other week over, oh my gosh, I don't think this is going to work, where I'm get, going to get the SB10 funds, which is a scholarship in Georgia for special needs. And she found the loophole. So <laughs> here we go. Um, I'm really excited about it. But yeah, having that network is huge. Yes. Yeah. And for those of you who aren't familiar with Slack, it's basically just a messaging platform. And we share a lot of information over it. You can quickly chat with one another. And I think one of the things that's really cool that's sort of a microcosm of um, why I love the Catalyst Fellowship is it at first was a lot of us sort of responding and saying, oh, think about this, think about that. And now it's like a lot of the micro school founders, the other 110 people, oh, yeah. 100 people that are in there are responding to each other and building off each other. And like you were saying, problem solving together, it's a really neat, yes. um, I just, I, I really like opening it every day. Um, okay, next question is about what pieces of your program would not be possible within the traditional system? Um, yeah. <laughs> like, why do you need to do? Why do you need to do? Why do you need a, a micro school to do this? Why can't you just go, you know, uh, teach in the traditional school system? Um, number one, because we don't. Okay, in my school, there's no way that the kids are spending a full day a week at the farm every single day. I mean, Probably every not. single week mm -hmm. if they're in traditional schools, right? Also, they have to. They have to um, have these standardized kind of ways of, of uh, just seeing that they're growing or that they're doing the right thing, right? So, like, there's the state test that they have to opt into, that the children have to do. Um, and for us, we don't have that. So my kids can show what they've learned in so many other ways, right? They can, um, they can create an art project mm -hmm. that shows everything that they learned in a unit, and that is sufficient. It's not something that they would get in a regular in a regular school. There's also um, the outdoor time. I feel like all of us. I think everyone who I've spoken to understands that kids need to get up. Yeah. They need to get up, and especially in the in the middle school. I feel like for me, um, when I was working in a traditional middle school, my students they 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 were treated like they were much older than they are. What? Middle schoolers are children, and they have this this innate creative nature and this playfulness about them. And if you don't give them that space, then childhood is impossible, right? And, and creativity and, and happiness and joy is just not possible. So creating this space where there's no top down, like you need to do this because this is what everyone's doing, um, breaking away from that and giving them space and autonomy and respect and agency, that wouldn't be possible without micro schools. And, uh, okay, so, so for me, and this is huge, at least in my community, for the, the learners uh, that I'm working with, parents being able to, you know, stop in and check on their children. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, that. We have, you know, children with some behavioral issues, and it's nice when parents can just stop in and say, hey, I'd just like to check on my child. Um, I tried to do that when my daughter was in public school, and they were like, wait right here. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and we're thinking about, you know, public schools at the height of, you know, the, the shutdowns and the, the security and all these issues, you know, unfortunately, that schools have had. They've had to be careful, mm -hmm. um, understandably so, but I'm glad we don't have to, you know, um, adhere to that. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, we have cameras and we have security systems and things of that sort, but... Again, it, it puts the parents' minds at ease that I can go stop in and check on my child. I can sit right in the front and, and work if I want to with my laptop and yeah. peek yeah. in when I want to, and it mm -hmm. works. Yeah. And sometimes we do have, unfortunately, meltdowns, and um, there's been a mom or dad right there who could go see their child, and you should see the look on the child's face like, <laughs> you shouldn't be. <laughs> You're in a micro school. <laughs> yeah. Right. And so it's shocking, you know, that they can walk in and kind of handle it, but that helps us too. Yeah. So again, it's it's us helping the families and them helping us um, collectively as a community to to help these children learn. Yeah. 
Yeah, and giving the, sorry, I don't mean no, to, mm -hmm. but also giving the parents the opportunity to choose curriculum too, Yes. right? That's such a big deal mm -hmm. um, because I feel like for, in schools, a lot of the times it's like, okay, you enrolled your child, give them to us. We got right. it from here. Right. You can go away. Yes. Um, and with us, it's so different. It's it's a village. It's mm -hmm. like a hub. It's a resource, not just for the children, but also for the for the parents, for the families. And we're, we're taking care of the whole child together as a community. And then that builds confidence in the children, too. They know that they're loved, yes. right? They come, that they come first. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. In, in my program, I've got a couple aspects that wouldn't fly in the traditional setting. Of course, being all boys, it's difficult in a public school. Um, mm -hmm. But we also have a, a, an age range of 8 to 18. Um, you're not going to find an age range of 8 to 18 in any single public school classroom. Um, but the idea behind that is to help foster leadership skills in the older boys and confidence in the younger boys, mm -hmm. right? They have somebody that's looking, that they can look up to, who's also there to support them. So that, that instills confidence in an eight-year-old, a 15-year-old is helping them with his work, right? Or they're doing a project together, or they're both standing up there, you know, giving a, a presentation. Um, so that's, that's another aspect that I think in, in my program, not, you can't replicate that in the public system. Mm -hmm. And then obviously, uh, selecting curriculum, you know, put 100% yeah. of that control in the parents' hands, mm -hmm. you're not finding that in the public school either. Right. Yeah. I think just going off the curriculum. So being a public school teacher 25 years, I'll have eighth graders in my room that can read on the third grade reading level, and they can read on the 12th grade reading level, yeah. all in the same classroom. Um, and you can only, you, you know, your focus is just in the middle. <laughs> but when you have a micro school, if we're all in a room, it's individualized learning. Mm -hmm. um, so we're, we're used to IEPs, but now we're doing ILPs. Mm -hmm. Like, where are you? How can we help you? Where is the gap? And we have the time to do it, mm -hmm. which is the biggest thing for me. Like, I didn't have time, and we have the time to do projects. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I didn't have the time to always do that, but in micro school, you have the time, and then you're able to individualize that learning. So talking about resources and curriculum, what are you guys thinking about using for next year? Are you going to be using technology? Are you using workbooks? Or like, how are you? What are some things that you're excited to implement um, in your programs? We are just using the stars. The whole <laughs> 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 okay. You have to let me know if that works. <laughs> so um, we use a mixture. So um, some of my parents and students will be coming with what they've already started doing. Mm -hmm. And so we're allowing them to bring in their curriculum. I, most of my parents right now are just looking at me like, what do you have? Yeah. <laughs> and that's okay. And so we kind of sit down and we have a discussion with the parents and the kids, where are you? There are so many um, things that even in our Catalyst Fellowship, they have been, we are exposed to. And so we just kind of sit down and narrow it down. We have not narrowed it down yet. Because I'm still listening to parents. So we have Khan Academy, we have just all of the things, and then we want to narrow it down. So if you don't come with your own curriculum, we'll have a set curriculum for us to follow or things to do, um, and then work with that individual child. So we're still progressing in that. Um, so we, my school also allows the parents to choose their own curriculum, and then they can opt in if they don't have one. They can opt in to what we use, and um, we're using Sunlight. Do you guys know Sunlight? It's a homeschooling yeah. curriculum. Mm -hmm. It's Christian. My school is Christian. I don't think I mentioned that. I'm sorry, Jesus. He's first. Um, <laughs> it's a Christian literacy-based program. So, you know, <laughs> right up that alley. Um, and then in terms of technology, um, so I, I, I got the kids um, – all of the things that they need to for their podcast. So there's a whole podcasting room with you know the mics and the soundboard and the that whole thing. Um, one of the locations I haven't settled on my location yet um, because Umar won't let me. But no, the one I want is too expensive, so he's saving me. But um, <laughs> no, but when I was speaking to my. Um, my, my realtor, he was saying that they could actually soundproof one of the rooms for me, which would be really great for that. Um, so, yeah, all that technology, Audacity, and, like, um, all of the things for, for video and sound editing, those things are going to be really exciting to implement. Yeah. My, my curriculum is 100% the choice of the parents. Um, I am less uh, – I don't know curriculum as well as I should. Let's put it that way. As a public school teacher, I was given the curriculum, and most of the time, I kind of pushed it off the side and wrote my own stuff. Um, you know, 
hit the state standards but did it in a different way. Yes. Um, I know that a lot of my families are going to bring their favorites. That's great. Uh, Ryan's kind of the curriculum mm -hmm. guru. Mm -hmm. You and I, you and I need to talk, Tom. But they have a, a really nice, well curated uh, library that I've yeah. gone through, picked out some that are all a cart and some that are all in one. Um, and I, I think it's really going to come down to the conversations that I have with the students, with their parents, and uh, what they're into. Um, I know that I can support any of it, or I hope that I can support any of it, but um, I, the whole point of the micro school is put the control in the parents' hands. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let me just help, right? In the public school, I was doing everything all the time, and uh, mm -hmm. it, it's not a winning strategy. And for me, this is where Kaipod is coming in and helping me tremendously. Um, so I initially hired a teacher who specialized in curriculum development. She was phenomenal, but that was before I completed my financial model. <laughs> right. So I was losing major money. Uh, so now Ryan is helping me figure out what the technology. Let's scale it back. Scale back. And we're still going through that. So I will have it chosen before school starts. <laughs> But I, okay. I think that's one of the things we have learned, that there are times you have to scale back uh -huh. and, and look at everything again and then go forward. Yeah. And I think that's what all of us have learned in our own way for a, a different category. Pause, mm -hmm. scale back, adjust, and then let's keep going forward. But the, don't stop moving. The word pivot. Oh yeah! Oh my God! Yeah, for sure. I, don't, I, don't pivot, pivot. I almost pivot went broke again. before yep. I started. <laughs> I was like, "Yeah, this is amazing. Come on, let's do it. We're with money, man." Sign me up. <laughs> okay, last question before we open up for questions from the audience. Um, how are you going to know if students at your school are successful? Oh, when they're curious. Mm -hmm. For me, it's going to be when they when they are. Um, when they're taking initiative, when, when they're not, I don't, if a child asks me, what do I need to do? And then I have failed, <laughs> right? Mm. I want them to be confident and curious and, and go-getters. And, um, and when that happens, then I know that I've done it. Mm. Yeah. Also, if my families are happy, mm. if they feel supported and if there's community buy-in, yeah. because I want the kids to know that they belong and that it's not just me and it's not just their mom, it's everybody. The, the community loves them mm -hmm. and they know that because we're in community and we're together and everyone's there to help them and there's a million people you can ask because you have the right to ask the questions and we're here, we're here for you. Like yeah. if, right. when, if I cultivate that, then, then I've, yeah. I've won. That's, that's what I was going to say. When... Um, you know, when you were when you're a public school teacher in a small town, the family wants you to teach the next child and the mm -hmm. next child, and they tell you, "Are you leaving next year?" No. Mm -hmm. Okay, good, because I have a sixth grader coming. Mm -hmm. And so that's how I feel. It's the same way with the micro school. Like like you said, the community knows, mm -hmm. and we get referrals. Mm -hmm. And this family tells that family, then that family tells that family, um, and then I believe in portfolios. Like we are going to keep track of your success, right. so that you can show off. That's what I tell my kids. We want to show off. So we want to show these are the things we're doing, these are the things we're learning, and we want to showcase that. So I think good portfolios, being able to showcase, um, and then those referrals. And then the kids coming back, because we have middle schoolers and high schoolers. So sometimes when they leave us, that's it. Mm -hmm. But you coming back and saying, hey, I want to show you, or um, sending me something on Facebook or Instagram, like this is where I am, this is what I'm doing, thank you. Um, I think that's very important. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we actually have already been through this. We've um, sent out surveys to the parents, mm. to the families, and then we've done basic placement testing just to see where the children are and what they need help on. Um, math is a big one. Um, and then also some of our kids were behind in reading and literacy. So um, in that survey, we do ask the parents not just you know uh, questions about where their child is and where they'd like them to be, but also how they feel about the program, if they feel anything needs to be modified, taken away, do we need to add something? You know, they give us mm -hmm. their true heartfelt feelings about it too. Yeah. And some things that the parents have asked for, we have not been able to implement mm -hmm. um, simply because we don't have the financing and the funding right now. But they've given us great ideas that we could possibly implement in the future. So that that parent survey is critical for us. Yeah, that's good. Um, 
kind of a, a piggyback to the, the question about what wouldn't fly in a public school. So when I was a public school teacher, I had 150 students at any given any given time. Um, I can't do direct feedback to 150 families every week. If I have six students, I can do it multiple times a week, mm -hmm. and that's going to help me gauge, you know, uh, more in a in a summative way, you know, what kind of uh, success we're having. Mm -hmm. um, and then you can also obviously, as, as uh, Amanda said, you know, are they excited? Do they come to school mm -hmm. encouraged? And you know, when when they're done with their academic stuff, we move into our, you know, I, I call it the Maverick Hour, but it's like a genius hour where they can explore mm -hmm. their own uh, interests. I mean, do they jump right into something, or do they just kind of dawdle around and ask, Mr. Dell, what should we do? Mm -hmm. You know, if they're if they're able to be a self-starter, that's success. Mm -hmm. um, hitting certain metrics isn't necessarily as important to me. Um, because those metrics were created with the public school system and promotion in mind, and this is a different, this is a whole different ball game. Yeah. Um, that said, if we're working on college readiness on any of my students, we will have to do some of those baselines and testing and, mm -hmm. and uh, prep readiness or test readiness. But um, outside of that, I, I think it's really going to be observational, feedback related uh, in, in terms of measuring success. Well, this is great. Um, I hope you guys felt like you got sort of an, an honest um, take on what it's like to open a school. Um, these folks are amazing. We learn a lot together. We have a lot of fun together. Um, and I hope that was shown here. So how about a round of applause for these guys? Um, and if there are questions in the audience, we are happy to take them. Isis. Um, so if you had to create a flyer, with only three words to describe your school, what would you put on that flyer? Christian first. Um, <laughs> Christian, um, mine would be uh, Christian. Um, I actually have one. I have a flyer. It says Christ centered, project based, and literacy based. So, yeah. What's yours? Your flyer is right there. Uh, mine has a whole lot more than three words on it. Uh, what can I strike off of this thing? Yes. Pick um, a three. I mean, it's a. Uh, Experiential, uh, boys only, service based. Mm. Um, I didn't. I didn't bring up the, that aspect of my school. Um, I'm the product of a, an all boy Catholic uh, education. Um, I went to a Jesuit high school, and we were men for others. Mm. And community service, a huge platform, yes. um, and so my program is going to be similar. So service based, uh, experiential, and boys only. Mm. I would say that's such a good question. I would say. Uh, Neurodiverse, two-gen learning. Uh, project base, curiosity, and creativity. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's a good question. Thank you. <laughs> um, and this is for you. I forgot your name. But Tom. Was Tom. Yep. Um, how do you motivate? and stimulate the interest in taking advantage of that. So, full disclosure, I'm not live yet, so I have no Mavericks yet. Um, but the, the idea will be to offer just a library of things to do um, in that time after they're done with their academics and before lunch. Um, so I've got, I've got puzzles, I've got games, I've got uh, AV equipment. Um, They'll have access to laptops and just anything that they really want to get into, a whole library of um, uh, fiction books, nonfiction books, um, and really just whatever they ask for, really. I mean, I'm not going to get a you know, request for a bunch of go-karts. Uh, I can't mm -hmm. satisfy that. But, you know, if they want a football and they want to go throw a football around you know, when they've got some time, get a football for them. It's not, it's not going to be difficult to, to find out what those, those curiosities and interests are and totally support it. It shouldn't be a problem. Mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. A follow-up on your question. Hypothetically, what would you do if all six or eight of your boys during another time want to play Roblox or mm -hmm. Minecraft? Great question. Mm, that is a good question. <laughs> if I can find some supporting curriculum for something along with that, that, mm -hmm. that keeps it educational, I'll tell you, as a, as a public school teacher, I couldn't tell you how many times, you know, I had a mirror that I put in the back mm -hmm. of the classroom so I could see the laptops. <laughs> and how many of them would be sitting on Minecraft? That is and, a really good idea. And, and I mean, I, I like games, but 
I gotta live a time and place. And the audacity of some of these boys that would turn to me and say, oh, Mr. P said that we need to be practicing this. Mr. P said you need to be practicing Roblox during social studies? <laughs> so, um, if, if there's curriculum that goes it. long and it's an educational mm -hmm. uh, game, I have no problem with that. I think there's yeah. definitely a place for, for games mm -hmm. in gaming. Mm -hmm. The other question was, how, do, how will you um, sustain yourself financially with so my first year, it should be easy because I've built my classroom on my property. So I have, I have no rent or lease that I have to pay. Um, that satisfies the expenses side, but it raises a whole bunch of compliance and zoning and those kinds of issues. Um, but Kaipod and <laughs> Kaipod, uh, Yes Every Kid yes, every uh, has been yeah. very helpful yes. trying to figure out Shout exactly out yes, how to, to walk this this line where these laws were written years and years and years ago before education has changed to what it is. Um, so right now, I believe I'm within compliance. Um, the, the not legal um, advice that Yes Every Kid gave me was sometimes it's better to ask for forgiveness than permission. So, mm -hmm. You know, again, if you want to do that. Um, so uh, luckily there's lots of organizations, especially in Arizona, um, one called the uh, San Juan Diego Institute um, that, happens to have connections with my town government. And so they've got insides. And mm -hmm. so again, all these opportunities that have presented themselves and these connections I'm able to make because of the Catalyst program really have it so that I'm not really stressed about a whole lot. If something comes up, I know that it can be solved. Mm -hmm. um, I have a part-time and a full-time model. So I have Monday through Friday, I have Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and then for the kids that just want to do the cool stuff, I have Fridays only. Mm -hmm. This is for you, Ryan. Oh, um, sure. <clears throat> so I'm down in Valdosta, Georgia, which is about as far south as you go down I 75 to New York. Okay. Uh, my company is called Retain Coaching, and we do educational workforce development consulting for youth and And this looks like a really outstanding solution for something that we've been trying to do, which is just create a totally alternative route for youth and care. Um, most of the ones that we get are over age high school students. And this is the difference between them plugging into you know, a successful future or falling off the grid completely. And I was wondering if you had any models, if you worked with anyone in your cohorts that built something like that or worked on something like that. I cannot think of anybody off the top of my head who has something like that, but I do agree that there's a, a need there. And I think that our program is set up to work with folks if they're, you know, if you know somebody who's interested in starting a program for those kids and getting that off the, yeah, Sorry. you, you want to do that. Oh, you're the one. Okay. Yeah. Let's talk. Um, our, our, our applications will be open uh, in the fall, early fall, and our next cohort is probably going to start in October. Um, no firm deadlines there, but um, yeah, I mean, I, be happy to talk about the program and what it would look like for you. Yeah. Mm. Um, I have a question actually for you then. <laughs> um, how are you finding funding for those types of boys to basically pay tuition? Because that's my sweet spot has always been the boys that have been rejected. Um, my side hustle right now is just uh, tutoring, but I tutor a lot of boys in group homes, foster mm -hmm. care, um, overage high school. Um, but trying to access the ESA funds that they should have access to, but don't because they're in state custody, a lot of them. I'm trying to figure out how to navigate that because those those boys will thrive in my program. Think back to about nine months ago. How are you different as people So nine months ago, how are you different than what I you are I think today? that I'm more of who I want my students to be. Mm, interesting. I'll say that because I want my kids to not take no for an answer, right? I want them to to go against the grain. I want them to stand for something. I want them to to have a problem with authority, right? Mm -hmm. I want them to be respectful, but I want them to care enough about something that even if it hurts and even if it's hard and even if it's new, that they're they're gonna do it. Mm -hmm. And and I feel like because I'm able, I'm doing this now. I can lead them better when in September when they come to me. Mm -hmm. um, 
because yeah, they, I I have this I have this experience. So I see I see that Amanda. <laughs> Yes, I do. I do. <laughs> it's a good answer. I think for me, my mind is more at ease now mm -hmm. than it was 10 months ago. So um, <coughs> the catalyst started, what, November? Yeah, November? yeah. late October. Yeah. And, you know, I just had all these worries at the time, and I had no idea how these issues were going to be solved. And just having not just the support group, but also the platform mm -hmm. um, and sounding boards mm -hmm. as well. Um, has put my mind at ease a lot. And then the, the progress that even the state of Georgia has made with the SB 233 being, um, you know, going into effect Tuesday, I am in a low, in a low income area and that's where I prefer to stay. So even if I were to move out of my current commercial space, I want to stay in areas where I can accommodate those families who, who need me the most. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so having that, um, you know, possibility in 2025 of being able to get the $6,500 um, from uh, from the state for the families who need it the most is it's really encouraging. So I actually have less wrinkles, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> oh, now I must go. Um, I had to unlearn. That was my biggest thing. Um, the system, and I was like, oh God, I was part of the system. The system had, I had, even though I was a maverick in the system and I was always that teacher that was like, I'm not doing it, that's stupid. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, whatever. And, and you know, a great teacher and was that teacher that they gave all of the kids that were challenging to. Yep. I had to unlearn some things. I had to unlearn that I don't have to do this by this time. I had to unlearn that, um, I have to negotiate. I can negotiate some things. Like we can do a give and take here. And so for me, nine months ago, I was still in this. Um, I was still in this traditional teacher mindset, and now I'm in, I'm more in a um, businesswoman, innovative educator mindset. And it is a dra is a huge jump, and it has been me unlearning. Um, and I and, and I didn't know I had packed a lot of stuff on my on my way here that I had to unpack. And so that has been the most important thing for me. Like, oh, I don't, mm -mm. Oh, we don't have to do it that way because they said it. I am they. Mm -hmm. And we're going to do it this way. So at the beginning of the program, I saw opportunity and I saw a need, um, but I didn't, I definitely didn't have the passion I have now. All right. So I saw opportunity, I saw need, but going through all the steps and meeting new families as I'm, you know, getting out there at vendor fairs or even just my, my tutoring and getting in with the, uh, the group homes. Um, I, I feel an importance in the, in the job, right? So this isn't just, oh, there's ESA dollars. I'm going to go try and grab them, which is what a lot of the opponents like to think all of us are doing. Mm -hmm. Um, I, the, the help and the, the good that I can do, I can feel and I know, and that's the driving factor now. It's, it's less about, you know, having a successful business and more about making a successful impact. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, okay. We got time, Freddie, and then the last one. Go ahead, Freddie. Mm. One sentence. I would like you guys to tell us what would what advice would you give yourself now, your yourself now from your past self that started. Quick Don't one. engage. <laughs> what would you give your? What would you tell yourself? Like, yeah, like your. I would tell myself, myself rather, to learn the regulations. <laughs> open the school, <laughs> so you don't get shut down four times. <laughs> yep. Uh, me, trust the process. Yeah. Right, and know that while I am the only person on my business license. Um, and it's at my address, I'm not the only one in this, right? right. I've got 110 colleagues that are helping me through it, mm -hmm. a supportive wife, my kids that constantly ask and make uh, recommendations or suggestions on what they would want in a classroom. Um, so I'm definitely not flying solo. Yeah. And so mm -hmm. I, I would have told myself that, like, don't worry, you got support. Mm -hmm. um, just keep swimming, it gets better. That's what I would say. Um, do it scared. Mm -hmm. Do it scared. Go to that vendor's fair, Freddie. Freddie, we're gonna go to that vendor's fair. We're going to 
speak to that parent in Starbucks. I'm going to speak to that mom in, in at the library in the parking lot. Um, I am going to introduce myself uh, when I'm networking and say, I own a micro school. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and I practice in the mirror and do it scared. Yeah. Do it scared. Right. I think we're at time, but we could, let's sneak the last one in. Yes, yeah, Go for it. Just a quick um, follow up on the, the deep hacking and relearning. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that I've noticed in working with kids coming out of the public school is there's a detox period of yes. time that yes. um, is important for our sanity to relax. Yeah. Their detox. Yes. And that's one of the things in being in the cohort that I've had to understand uh, when we start to give us that August and September. So in traditional school, that's when we do the routines, but I also have to give my older kids who've been in for a minute that detox time. Right. So like you said, to say, you don't need to raise your hand to go to the bathroom, baby. Just go. Right. Go yeah. But it's also our time to learn them. Yes. Right? We need to take the time to see who they are and how we can effectively teach them and, and care for them. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is great. Thank, Thank you all for coming to this one. <laughs>